Hi, this is Stephen Downs once again for Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care. We're in Module 6. This is the presentation on caring and pedagogy. And a couple preliminaries before we get going. Uh, first of all, that hum you hear in the background is the fan because Andrea is doing some baking. Uh, that's life in the pandemic, right? And, and actually, that's life as me. I don't have a nice studio where I can record these things. So you're gonna get some background noises. That's just the way it is. Um, I'll see if I can't filter that out at some point in the future. Um, but right now it can't really be helped. And you know, it's life, right? You're getting real life here. Um, secondly, I'm looking at the image that I'm using as the title slide here. And I'm sensitive to the fact that it represents a number of the things that I found as criticisms of a pedagogy, or sorry, of a, an ethics of care. Uh, you know, we've got the, you know, the standard group of people sitting around a computer or two computers, uh, or, you know, they actually look like maybe Surface Pads or Mac Airs or whatever. I don't know. I can't really tell. But, you know, you, you see how we have the authority figure hovering over them, the, the white male teacher um, who's obviously in charge, has his arms crossed in a position of judgment. We've got the, the center figure is a hooded figure, obviously in some way or another a minority. We know that because of the, the, uh, the hoodie. There is a nod to diversity. Uh, note the skull cap on, on one of the uh, participants here. And down in the lower right hand corner, you can just see the long hair of a woman participant. So it's not all male. But you know, it's just so hackneyed. And it's so from the perspective of um, you know, the, the people who are doing the caring, or in, in this case, at least providing the service. And I think that the same scene taken from the perspective of the person in the center of the room would be much more interesting. Anyhow, uh, that's a little critical pedagogy for you right there with respect to the um, title image. Also, before I get going, um, I want to come back to something I raised the other day, um, and that's the uh, Creative Commons shirt that I was wearing. Here it is, and I made a comment about it being manufactured in Hong Kong. It was not manufactured in Hong Kong. It was manufactured, I don't know if I'll be able to show you this, but I'm going to try. You know, oh, it's, it's kind of beat up. I've worn it a lot. Uh, <laughs> All right, there we go. I don't think it'll focus. Yeah, maybe. There, yeah, you can just barely see it. Made in Nicaragua. Um, and by a company called Next Level Apparel. So, of course, because, you know, I'm socially responsible. I looked up Next Level Apparel to find out about them. And so here they are. Um, they're based in Southern California. Uh, though I guess their shirts are made everywhere. Uh, their, their overall, uh, you know, they have o overall apparel generally, not just shirts. But I like, you know, the way they emphasize community, sustainability, inclusivity. And that's the kind of structural, uh, structural approach that's needed when you think of an ethics of care, not just a prop, not just as a property of individuals, but as a property of communities and of society. So, kudos to Creative Commons. Now, maybe there's stuff about this company I don't know, um, but what this tells me is that. They at least, at Creative Commons, at least thought about it, um, thought about sourcing the shirts sustainably and ethically and responsibly. And so I think that's a good thing. So today, 
we're talking about um, the topic of caring and pedagogy and I, I deliberately not I deliberately didn't put pedagogy of care in the title because that's not really what we're talking about in this particular presentation uh, we're talking more generally about the idea of the intersection between caring and pedagogy because there, there's two ways in which this happens first of all if you have the presumption of an ethics of care as being not just an individual but a community um, value then you're going to want to say something about how you teach care um, assuming that care is not innate or the ability to care is not innate and and you know I see sometimes representations of a philosophy of care and an ethics of care from a feminist perspective as representing the idea that it is innate it is unique to women uh, and in particular unique to women who have been in a caring relationship but most of what I've read virtually all of what I've read doesn't lean in that direction um, it leans in the direction of care as something that can be learned something that can be taught and that there are ways uh, that we can approach the teaching of care such that it is promoted as not only a personal ethic but a community ethic as instantiated in the company that Creative Commons used to source its t-shirts so there's that and then as well there's the pedagogy of care uh, which takes a look at the uh, the uh, art um, or the profession of teaching as a care profession and what that entails so I'll touch briefly on that near the end but let's get into this now so the way we're gonna get into this is uh, we're gonna begin with the concept of democratic education and the reason why we're getting into the concept of democratic education is because that's where the ethics of care begins as well we look at bell hooks in teaching community she writes educators who challenge themselves to teach beyond the classroom setting to move into the world sharing knowledge learn a diversity of styles to convey information um, and additionally authoritative <laughs> try that again authoritarianism in the classroom dehumanizes and thus shuts down the magic that is always present when humans or when individuals are active learners and this is something that we've seen reflected in numerous theories of education uh, you see it reflected in my own approach to education my own approach to learning generally um, where we're moving first of all moving away from the model of education where there is an authority where that authority spreads knowledge and the people in the class receive knowledge in other words we're moving away from the image despite the fact that it was on a website titled pedagogy of care uh, we're moving away from the image that we saw on our title screen but we're also moving away from the idea that education uh, and educators are things that simply and only exist in the classroom uh, the act of education is broader than that the act of teaching is broader than that and uh, you know bell hooks's approach recognizes that i think uh, and this is something that has become mainstream and that's why I wanted to put in here the reference framework reference framework of competencies for democratic culture of the Council of Europe and I'm just stumbling over my words a bit so I'll get a little liquid into myself you know doing things like dealing with propaganda and misinformation and fake news but also improving well-being at school making children's and students voices heard 
I'd go further and, and give them actual power. Uh, preventing violence and bullying, obviously, and tackling discrimination. So the idea here is that uh, education is at least beginning to express some of the principles of care that we're also finding in uh, the field of health care uh, and other professions. And that's important, and that's the starting point for all of this. Um, in an ethics of care, especially as it relates to teaching and education, there's a commitment to uh, not just diversity, but also pluralism. Uh, there, there's a few things about this discussion that resonate with me, um, and I, I'm going to go over them in a little bit of detail. Okay, the first thing is um, the assertion here that, um, again from Bell Hooks, pluralism is not diversity. Pluralism is a response to the fact of diversity. In pluralism, we commit to engage with the other person or the other community. Pluralism is a commitment to communicate with and relate to the larger world. Now, in my own work, um, I have something called the semantic condition. The semantic condition argues that as a property of networks, in order to achieve a properly functioning network, you need four elements, diversity, interaction, openness, um, and autonomy. Um, now we've discussed autonomy earlier and, and there are different ways we could look at that. And now we discuss diversity here with respect to pluralism. Now we might say, that's not a bad way of saying it, uh, that pluralism is kind of the combination of diversity and interactivity. But if you make, you know, if you think of it from the perspective of a network, it kind of makes sense. Well, kind of makes sense. It really makes it. It makes a lot of sense because um, diversity is an asset. Um, any individual within a network wants to get signals or communications from a diverse range of sources. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, most notably that if they're getting information from the same range of sources, uh, then they're not really acting in any sort of evaluative or considering capacity. They're just simply passing along whatever they've heard, which goes against the principle of interactiveness in a network because learning in a network isn't just passing on stuff that you've heard, it's reacting to and coming up with your own perspective and passing that along, creating a pattern of interaction in the network. And that pattern itself is what constitutes learning. You don't get patterns unless you have not simply the existence of diversity in the network, but a network structure such that uh, individuals in the network are touching on and interacting with a variety of diverse individuals. So more broadly and more structurally, looking at it maybe from a sociological point of view, what you're trying to do is to create an environment where people don't just interact with people of their own kind, but interact with a wide range of people. And then you can get into a larger discussion of this, of the impact of this, and you know, we've, I think we've all seen, or maybe should have all seen, cases or examples of where people encounter another culture or another perspective for, for the first time, and their view of the world is in some important way changed. Um, and certainly in this field, there's a commitment to talking to individuals who are impacted not just directly by our care, but the members of the wider community that might be impacted by the decisions that we make and the way we conduct ourselves. 
So this idea is represented visually on the slide um, in this paper uh, on uh, an ontology of climate change, believe it or not. Um, but still, uh, you still have the same idea of the singularity, the mono vision. Uh, then uh, you have a discon discontinuity where there's many different diverse entities in the network, but they're not connected. And then multiplicity, which is described here as one and many, which is pluralism, where you have these diverse perspectives, but they overlap, they interact with each other. Um, and so it's interesting because Bell Hook says the points to the problem, if you will, um, not so much of embracing diversity, People at Harvard are, are happy to have black people or religious minorities or whatever. Um, but the problem is resisting pluralism. They're not. They're happy to have them in the school, but they're not going to socialize with them. They're not going to welcome them to the club. Okay, maybe that's unfair. It probably is unfair. Um, but, you know, you, you get the idea of integration of neighborhoods, right? And so you have people, diverse people in your neighborhood, but when you're making friends and interacting with people, you're, the problem is people are still interacting with their own kind, whatever that kind happens to be. I'm reminded of when I grew up in the suburb of Candiac, uh, it's a suburb of Montreal, and we lived right next door to French people. We never interacted with them. We interacted with the English people down the road and the English people up at the corner, not the French people at all. I never knew any French people the entire time I lived there. And that's a problem, right? Because that's what leads to conflict uh, rather than engagement and uh, a wider society of care. It's an aspect of this is culturally responsiveness I'm sorry, cultural responsiveness. Um, and in particular here, we're talking about culturally responsive instruction. Um, I might broaden that to say culturally responsive education or even culturally responsive learning. Um, but here, um, the suggestion is it should focus on improving the learning capacity of the marginalized education. There's my, it's, I think my slide is covering some words here. Oh yeah, it's definitely covering some words here. That's really annoying. Um, okay. Uh, so focus on the learning capacity of communities that have been marginalized educationally because of historically um, devalued or underfunded, I'm not sure what the exact word says, school systems. Um, it should center around both the affective and cognitive domains of teaching and learning. Just working from memory here, folks. Um, and it should build a cognitive capacity and academic mindset by pushing back on dominant narratives about people of color. And I would say pushing back on dominant narratives, aka stereotypes, not only about people of color, but about women, um, about religious uh, minorities, um, about indigenous people, uh, about gays and lesbians and trans and questioning and, and two-spirit and the rest. Um, the idea here is to look at your community not as a single cohesive whole, but to recognize, embrace, and value the different cultures that are represented within it. And so there's, there's two aspects, right? The first of all is the aspect of actually having this diversity in your community, because not all communities have this diversity. And then the second aspect is actually working with it and making it a value or a strength. So I talked about 
the uh, semantic condition. Another one of the principles that I mentioned is openness. And in an effort to teach or educate or even learn about an ethics of care, openness is again another one of these values. And you see that reflected in Bell Hooks again as well. And, and just as an aside, I really am seeing a lot of overlap there. Just to be clear, I was in, influenced in my own thinking in no way by Bell Hooks. Um, but it's interesting to see uh, how these kinds of views converge. And she's coming from a completely different perspective from me. And yet, um, there is some overlap here in the things that she sees as important and the things that I see as important. And so we read, one of the most positive outcomes is a commitment to, quote, radical openness, close quote. The will to explore different perspectives and change one's mind as new information is presented. Now, I've never represented that as, quote unquote, will. Right, I, I don't work in, in terms of will and, and, and other elements of what could be called folk psychology. Nonetheless, openness, um, however it is accomplished by an individual in a community or in a network, is a value. It's one of these things that makes the network work, makes the community work. Um, and you know, we, we can talk about it leading to a community of care, um, which is good, but we can also talk about it as leading to a community that, I don't want to say searches for the truth, because that's not quite right, but a community that is uh, epistemologically robust. How about that? Um, in the sense that uh, the knowledge, beliefs, and overall community culture will be improved. And the suggestion here in Hooks is it's improved by the fact that it becomes a community where the ethics of care exists. Um, but my, my take would be it's improved by whatever constitutes being improved. So I'm not prepared to commit to saying the ethics of care is the ideal end point for a community. And I don't think Hooks would say that either. Um, but I do want to say that the sorts of things that Hooks says lead to this uh, understanding and instantiation of an ethics of care in a community is the same sort of thing that I'm talking about. She also comments, competitive education rarely works for students who have been socialized to value working for the good of the community. And I find that a fascinating remark. I think it's also true of research and the professions generally. Um, it's really weird to think of, for example, competitive health care. Uh, you know, it almost brings to mind the era of ambulance chases. Of course, that's competitive law, but you know, can, you, can you, or and ch ambulance chasing. Can you imagine if there was an accident and there were competing healthcare companies arriving on the scene? It used to happen in the case of fires. It's very well represented in the movie Gangs of New York, where you had rival, rival fire departments arriving at a fire and breaking out into a fight with each other rather than actually fighting the fire. Um, and I find it true in my own experience. Um, you know, I work with the public service. I'm trying to work for the good of the community. And yet in the wider academic environment and indeed in the wider funding environment, there's this constant push to have me compete with other researchers and other projects or other programs for funding resources and support and you know it just all of that you know, none of that works for me because i want to work with these other people rather than against them um there's an element in all of this um 
and I wasn't sure where to place it, but I'll place it here because in again in my work it shows up in my approach to teaching and research, where there's this attempt to reduce, and here I'm quoting Noddings, all teaching and learning to one well-defined method um, as part of a larger pattern in science, epistemology, epistemology and ethics. And it has, been, it has been criticized by many contemporary theorists. Now, uh, the title of this slide should remind people uh, of the title of a book by um, oh jeez <laughs> told you I'm terrible with names terrible Paul Feyerabend um, again called Against Method right um, and there's this you know long standing tradition that there's a thing called scientific method and it's characterized by, um, you know, a hypothetical deductive system or a deductive nominological system where, you know, you come up with a hypothesis. Um, the hypothesis makes predictions in the world. You go out and test those predictions. Um, and the result of that test either confirms or disconfirms or falsifies that hypothesis. And so you have Carl Hempel promoting this. Uh, the falsification version is attributed to Karl Popper. And there's a, a huge, there's a wealth of discussion on this. Um, you know, a lot of this comes from the logical positivist tradition, but the idea of a scientific method dates back to you know, Francis Bacon and the original inductive method and has been with us ever since. Um, Descartes um, talks about uh, discourse on method um, and you know it's part and parcel with this idea of ethical universality um, this methodological universality is subject to many of the same sort of criticisms um, and you know here, here we have Again, we're still quoting here from Nottings, uh, talking about theologian Mary Daly, calling this pursuit methodolatry. I guess it's like idolatry, but with respect to method. It's the worship of method. And, and it says, philosophers, scientists, ethicists, and many other thinkers have tried since the time of Descartes and before to substitute foolproof method for the situated living human being who must think and decide. Method became all important. And we see this in teaching as well. And there's been a lot of criticism over the years about connectivism based on the, the idea that it's not a learning theory because a learning theory would have this all encompassing method. Um, but from my perspective, uh, what's essential about connectivism is this human who must think and decide. And connectivism in general talks a lot about the autonomy of the individual uh, in a network. Now, again, we talked about autonomy and the idea that we don't want to have a theory that rests simply and solely on the autonomy of individuals as compared to the community as a whole, right? We want to be able to talk about the ethics of a community as well as the ethics of an individual, for example. And I get that and I agree with that. Um, at the same time, we want to be careful not to impose some kind of uh, structural overlay on how these individuals and how these communities should actually think and decide in the moment. Each community is going to be different. Each individual is going to be different. It's going to depend on the concrete facts um, at the time. And that's why we get a diversity of communities, right? If there were just one universal good best method for forming communities, then presumably, you know, if science is right, 
they would all converge to the same model. And sometimes people rarefy, say, democracy as that model. Um, but why well, there's a lot of trains today for a Sunday? I wonder what's going on. Hmm. Anyhow, I'll leave that aside. See, that's the sort of thing, right? Uh, there's a lot of trains for a Sunday. Um, general plans don't accommodate the fact that there are a lot of trains on a Sunday. Okay. Anyhow. Uh, okay, I'm trying to make that work and maybe not. Uh, but you get the idea, right? Um, it's more about the individual or the community or global society in the context of the time. And that's, you know, that in the philosophy of science is an idea that goes back to Thomas Kuhn writing in the 1970s in, ironically, the International Encyclopedia of the Unification of the Sciences. <laughs> uh, very ironically. Uh, Kuhn is famous for coming up with the concept of a paradigm, a research paradigm, for example. Paradigm shifts, scientific revolutions, all the like. Um, and we sort of have this natural inclination to think, you know, each scientific revolution is better and better and better. There's no particular reason to believe that, um, except perhaps by the results of what was produced. Uh, but what's important for Kuhn and what's relevant for our senses, uh, for, for our purposes, is that when we're looking at the, the scientists and the scientific community within a specific paradigm, we need to consider it and evaluate it from the perspective of that paradigm. Otherwise, we're committed to saying things like, uh, Aristotle was really stupid. And Aristotle was not really stupid, and there's no reason to believe he was really stupid. Um, I wonder if I'm actually recording. No, I'm not. Well, I'm, str I'm recording, but I'm not uh, streaming. That's too bad. I wonder what happened. Um, hmm. um, it's stream finished. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to keep recording anyway. Something broke in YouTube. But uh, I'll upload this video and it'll still be all fine. That's really annoying when that happens. Um, it probably broke when, for some reasons, that window went to, or that screen went to that window. Anyhow. Um, so, what does that tell us about the moral education needed? Uh, in order to promote an ethical community where that ethics is an ethics of caring, right? Um, and, and here I'm, I'm going to actually refer to Jenny McNess's summary of No Noddings, which is very good and I recommend reading it, um, where we have the ethical ideal is to be the one caring and to meet the other morally. Now, again, want to be careful because we're not working in terms of ideals or universal principles, right? So what I think we want to say here is that to be ethical is to be the one caring and to meet the other morally or something like that. Um, you know, it's not an ideal toward which we all aspire and we have this universal of an ethics of care, which we should all be. Um, it's more like uh, in order to promote an ethics of care, we need to teach in a caring manner. Um, and I think we capture that in this quote from Noddings, moral education from the perspective of an ethic of caring has four major components, modeling, dialogue, practice, and confirmation. Um, I compared that almost immediately with my own Downs theory of education, which I have said many times is ironic because it's not really a theory and it doesn't originate with me, nor is, is it unique to me. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, 
GNU's not Linux or GNU's not Unix or whatever. It's one of these self-referential and self-depreciating um, or, um, you know, like lame. Lame ain't a multimedia encoder. Anyhow, um, so the, the Downs educational theory says to teach is to model and demonstrate to learn is to practice and reflect. And so we, we can see, in a way, these same four components in Nodding's approach to um, moral education. Um, I also run through that with the ideas of choice, identity, and creativity. That represents the, the path of the learner through this model. Um, and we, we've talked about uh, choice or autonomy. We've talked about identity to a certain degree. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about creativity, but it's there. Uh, and then an ethics of care. I haven't seen a discussion of the ethics of care and creativity. I'm sure it's out there. Um, I just haven't reviewed that. So anyhow, so we have these components. So let's look at these components for a bit. Um, modeling. Um, the idea here is that um, we do not tell our students to care. We show them how to care by creating caring relationships or caring relations with them. Um, and why? Because the capacity to care may be dependent on adequate experience in being cared for. Makes sense, right? Um, so the, the the distinction here is between modeling and telling. Um, and I think it's a really important distinction. And it's, it's one I've talked about many times. And so in order to promote, if you will, an ethics of care, certainly in order to teach about an ethics of care, or to maybe more accurately provide an opportunity for people to learn about an ethics of care, you need to model the ethics of care by yourself being caring. And that, that includes a variety of things, a, a variety of personal properties. I don't see it as an expression of the will, so-called, um, but I do see it as uh, the adopting of a range of uh, attitudes and behaviors. Everything from facilitation to self-care to unconditional acceptance of others, adaptation, health, holism, etc. Right now, we, we could talk about at some length about exactly what should be modeled, but here again, right, we we don't want to descend into a false universalism, and that's kind of why I respond to Jenny McNess's statement, the ethical ideal is to be one caring and to meet the other morally. Um, we can say it like that, but there's no one thing that all and only people who are the one caring should be. Uh, actually being caring is going to vary from circumstance to circumstance to circumstance. And together we can call all of these circumstances uh, instances of caring and therefore the person doing it as being the one caring but you know we can't define it in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions is going to be as a category more like what Wittgenstein would call a family resemblance right um, or in the language of my own epistemology it they will be instances of what we would recognize as caring behavior, where our recognition is uh, trained on uh, experiences of being cared for and observations of other people caring. Dialogue is the... Um, is an important consideration here and so I'm going to consider that for our purposes as the demonstration aspect of the relationship right so 
because we had to model and demonstrate, practice and reflect. So the dialogue is the demonstration part. We've got the modeling bit, right? But the dialogue is talking about whatever has been modeled. So we're, we're not just doing it, we're actually demonstrating it. Sometimes people in educational theory talk about worked examples. And this is kind of like that, except we don't just present people with a worked example. Rather, we take the model as the beginning or the starting point of the conversation. Um, and that's why Nodding says, you know, it's not just talk or conversation. It's not presentation, but it's something open-ended. Uh, we're engaged in a common search here. Now, she says for understanding, apathy, or appreciation. But it could be a common search for pretty much anything to do with what we're, we're talking about. Um, and, you know, you can highlight understanding, apathy, or appreciation as elements of the ethics of care. But, you know, if, if we're engaged in a dialogue about learning how to do something, anything about what we're talking about is fair game. This is what uh, Noddings calls engrossment. Um, you know, and again, it's not just idle chit chat. We're actually paying attention to each other, communicating with each other and attending to each other. And this gets back to what I was talking about earlier when I talked about um, active listening and, and the program that I took all those years ago. Right? Active listening is an example of an approach to attending um, in such a way that uh, you're engrossed in the conversation. Um, to engage in dialogue, says Bell Hooks, is one of the simplest ways we can begin as teachers, scholars, and critical thinkers to cross boundaries. This interaction back and forth between ourselves and people who are modeling or instantiating different ways of different thing of doing things, different ways of living, different cultures, etc. Uh, and it, it ties back to democratic education. Conversation, says Hooks, is the central location of pedagogy for the democratic educator. Um, it's important to understand what's going on in conversation here. Uh, a lot of people will represent conversation in kind of a theoretical perspective where the conversation has a purpose or an end in mind and it's based on say the construction of a common model or common reality uh, or shared understanding or it's to engage in a shared practice of making meaning etc and i want to reject all of that and i want to reject all of that again because of this universalism thing uh, there is no universal description of how conversation applies to the teaching and learning process. The, the act of conversation in itself is the teaching and learning process. And what happens, at least to my mind, is that what we are doing is experiencing the other person in the act of doing whatever it is that they're doing and being clear about what their thinking process is. And then how we attend to that and how we integrate that experience with the rest of our experiences varies from person to person to person. We don't all make models or make meaning, right? Um, and it would be a mistake to say, no, this is the attitude you should take to conversation. No, not at all. You're just trying to learn. And what you're trying to do here is not to memorize, not to build structures, but just to take in and integrate in some way, however is appropriate for the circumstances, what you're experiencing and what you're seeing. Very often, it will be for the replication of a behavior. Uh, sometimes it will be for the understanding of a person's point of view. Sometimes it will be in order to provide the best possible care to that person. You see, the, 
and it's always going to be a blend of things like that uh, and other things like that. And so it's a mistake to say, you know, there has to be the specific purpose of a conversation. Um, we have, you know, almost an example of the sort of perspective that I'm reacting to in, in critical digital pedagogy. And here I'm borrowing from Jesse Stommel's description of it. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I mean, we can look even at the different meanings of critical and this is what he does here critical as in mission critical critical as in literary criticism critical as in reflected and nuanced critical as in criticizing impediments uh, or barriers to to learning or critical as a disciplinary approach i like that i, I like the many meanings of critical when we talk about critical pedagogy uh, I have the same kind of thing in mind when I talk about critical literacies. I have all of these different meanings of critical that I want to apply to, con to concepts of meanings. But we don't want to take that and turn it into a recipe for pedagogy, right? Um, so let's look at this. Uh, a critical digital pedagogy perspective on MOOCs involves generating collaborative spaces for intrinsically motivating co-intentional education, online learning, and critical practice, and demands that open educational environments be more than content repositories. Therefore, a MOOC cannot simply be a delivery device, but must first be aimed at building empowered communities, making MOOCs a space for dialogue, openness, and change. Well, that's pretty prescriptive. And some MOOCs should do that. Some MOOCs should do some of that. But it would be a mistake that all MOOCs should do all of that and only that. There are contexts in which having a content repository is a really useful and helpful thing. Um, because of the limited participation in this MOOC, I'm kind of hoping this is one of those circumstances, right? Uh, I think YouTube taken as a whole is one of those circumstances. Uh, YouTube does not become meaningless or unhelpful simply because the interaction capacity is so terrible. I was going to say because it lacks it, but no, it doesn't lack it. It has it. It's just, it's awful. Never read the comments on a YouTube video. So the same sort of thing here, right? So similarly, uh, I don't agree that we're engaged in the process of co-intentional education. Uh, each individual in an education interaction has their own objectives, their own goals, their own purposes, their own methods, uh, their own ideas, their own background knowledge. And the idea that all of that should somehow morph into co-intentional education seems wrong. Um, it, it, actually, it seems miraculous that that would ever happen. And so I think making that an intent um, would be a mistake. Again, um, the idea of a MOOC and even critical pedagogy in a MOOC isn't to create this mechanism where we all become as one. It is to create this mechanism in which all the individual uh, variables, the different cultures, the different perspectives are uniquely valued and embraced. So it's not about creating co-intentional education. It's about creating diverse, uh, pluralistic, responsive, engaged, engrossed, attentive education. And even that might be asking too much and to be defining it too specifically. Uh, the next stage is practice. Um, and, and we see practice talked about quite a bit with respect to an ethic of care uh, and, and particularly with respect to sharing the ethics of care and 
the sense in which I take it here, as opposed to modeling here, is the practice on the part of the learner in providing care. Um, attitudes and mentalities are shaped by experience. There's lots of evidence for that. And training programs don't just teach the knowledge or skills, but they shape the mind. So I've, I've represented this not as shaping a mind, which is really very much like a power relation, right? You know, the, the master architect shapes the mind of the people under them. That's not what's happening at all. But what we want to happen is for the person, the learner, to actually have experience of being the carer in a caring relation and being the cared for in a caring relation. And these experiences uh, are both cases of practicing and ethics of care. And that is what, if you will, shapes minds. Although it's not an intentional shaping of a mind, it's more like a, a more unintentional growing of a mind into a person who is uh, who instantiates an ethics of care. So the the recommendation here in this reference is for things like, for example, community service, but not just community service qua community service, right? You know, it's not just picking up garbage off the side of the highway or something like that. Um, it's community service, but with people who demonstrate caring. So you're in this community service environment, people around you are modeling caring, and part of this community service is you uh, engaging in caring practices as well. Um, finally, and th this, is, this is the part that perhaps there's the least accord with the Downs theory of education, is this idea of confirmation um, and this, I think, I, I think al this almost speaks to the background, and I noticed this in a number of the authors. They're coming from a background uh, in religion and theology, and they're bringing concepts from religious writers into the realm of ethics. And hence, here we have uh, Martin Buber, who describes confirmation as an act of affirming and encouraging the best in others. Confirmation, um, at least in the religion that I practiced when I was young, um, is uh, a process where you affirm and state your belief in the religion. And you do that at a time when you are presumed to be an adult and able to make that as a free choice. Now, just for the record, I was not an adult, and I was not making that as a free choice. Well, I was sort of making that as a free choice, but I, I think I was like 12 or 13 or something, and I was making a free choice very much in the context of the community in which I was living. Um, but, but confirmation as well is an approach where you're saying, um, you know, it's not about whether or not you have achieved this perfect ideal, but whether or not you can see yourself uh, growing and developing and moving towards something that is your best. Now, we wanna be careful here. Remember, we go back to virtue ethics, right? Uh, and the concept of you know being all that you can be. Don't think that's really this, um, but it, it's more like well, more like um, what we read here. Think this is Nottings, but I, uh, yeah, it is Nottings. Uh, we do not set up a single ideal or set of expectations for everyone to meet, but we identify something admirable or at least acceptable struggling to emerge in each person we encounter. So it's something like seeing the good in others. Now that's not exactly what I mean by reflection. But then again, I don't mean anything in particular about reflection. Um, so, so this could be an instance of it. Um, the whole concept of reflection for me is 
uh, an almost unconscious process of just letting the experience settle and merge with the rest of our experiences and then drawing out of that whatever we can. Here, it's a case of drawing out the best of whatever it is that we can, uh, of confirming what was good in the experience uh, as opposed to groaning and complaining about what was bad about the experience. So I can see this as, you know, as a value, as something that would be affirmed in an ethics of care. Um, I'm, I'm a bit more globalist here. Um, when I'm reflecting on an experience, I want to reflect on all of the aspects of the experience. And if I had to employ a condition, I would employ salience rather than goodness. Uh, you know, it's what aspects of the experience were the most vivid, the most memorable, the most important, the most impactful. Uh, that to me is probably what I would want to draw from it. But I can certainly see the motivation for wanting to find the good in our experiences of others, particularly when we think about how that's going to be reflected back to them in our ongoing discussion and in our ongoing relationship of care. And, you know, even generally, there's this idea of thinking with care um, you know, and as you know, we, we can think of this as a mechanism of reflection or perhaps guidance on what might be good, caring reflection. And uh, <clears throat> here we have De La Bella Casa um, referencing back to Donna Haraway's relational ontology of the different ways of reflecting on our interactions with others. So we can be thinking with, thinking with other people, actually engaging in the thoughts with them. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the actual concrete embedded nature of our interactions with them. And I love this story of Haraway surprising a room by, in her keynote, uh, basically structuring her keynote around stories of personal care for her dog, Cayenne. Now, I would never name a dog Cayenne, but you know, maybe it was a Chihuahua or something, I don't know. Um, but I love the concept. Um, and, and I do love the idea of taking very specific, concrete experiences and structuring a presentation around them. I might do that more. Or I might not, because it, it did surprise the room. Um, there's also the idea of dissenting within. Um, you know, the relationality is everything. But this does not mean a world without conflict or dissension. And that's a fact. Uh, that's, a, that's an observable fact. Um, and I think that, you know, when we're talking about attending to, conversing with, and respecting the expressed needs of the cared for, it doesn't mean that we're in a position now where we do everything that the cared for wants. And this is an important concept. Um, we are not servants or slaves. And there is a criticism of care ethics that it is, you know, quote, unquote, a slave mentality. But it is not. Um, the relation of care is an interactive relationship. Both parties have power. Both parties have responsibility. Um, it's about being accurate and correct in assessing and understanding what the needs are of that person but also being aware of one's own condition, one of one's own needs for self-care, as well as, you know, what the impact is on other members of the community, both the immediate community and the wider community, perhaps even as appropriate to the global community. So of course there's gonna be conflict. Uh, your need for care might conflict with my need for self-care. You might be drowning and I can't swim. Um, if I serve only your need and jump in and try to save you, 
I'm putting myself at risk. So there's a conflict there. And, and how we respond to that conflict, you know, can't be expressed by a general principle, but it's on the immediate circumstances. Could I possibly save that person even though I can't swim? Is there a way to do that? Is there a way to jump in and save the person? Um, I don't know how, but, but you know, imagine a circumstance. You know, maybe the water's three feet deep, and I don't really need to be able to swim, but they're panicking and drowning in three feet deep water. You know, just things like that. Thinking for um, is the third, and it is, quote, a commitment to value knowledge generated through any context of subjugation. And that's important because the person who has been oppressed, the person who has been disadvantaged or is in a position of vulnerability, has a unique and distinctive perspective on those conditions. And so that point of view needs to be given some kind of privilege in our overall assessment. Because remember, care is about you know the the you know we're we're measuring our interactions with others measuring is the wrong word there but we'll leave that aside um from a perspective of vulnerability and we're we're trying to address conditions of vulnerability address conditions of injustice or oppression so where that exists that is the thing that if recognized and valued becomes the thing that produces in us a sense of urgency and motivation. So thinking for is the first step in that process. You know, in our interaction with someone else, um, the first thing we do is to acknowledge and take into account how they might be speaking or behaving from a position of subjugation or oppression. And our responsibility from an ethics of care is to begin by mitigating that as much as we can. So there is a way of reflecting on an experience um, that is non-normative. And I'm not going to talk about any of these things as normative. I'm not going to say these are the things that we have to do. Um, but these are aspects of the things that we do. And there are elements of reflection that result in a reflection that results in an ethic of care. Or maybe more accurately, are characteristic of a reflection that is consistent with an ethic of care. Um, the, the whole idea here, I, I just, I threw in this slide on inclusion, perhaps it belongs more in community or democracy. Um, but I think it's important because again, it speaks back to this idea of trying to create a commonality or a unified purpose around the process of teaching and learning, right? Um, and there, there isn't a fifth circle here, and there should be a fifth circle, and the fifth circle should consist of all and only green dots, and that circle would be assimilation, right? Um, assimilation has been, and too many people still is, the objective of community. Um, assimilation basically means um, having everybody adopt the, the, a common goal, a common belief set, a common perspective, a common worldview, a common language, or some combination of all of those things and others that are similar to it. And you know, you see efforts uh, toward assimilation when you see efforts to have people share a common purpose uh, or develop a common model um, or speak the same language. 
reach common definitions of terms. That's a very common one. Um, you know, um, and I find assimilation personally to be very problematic, um, especially since what happens in the case of assimilation is whatever the dominant beliefs, values, perspectives, etc., are of the majority, these are imposed on the minority. And we saw that in Canada with the residential schools where the process was one of assimilation. Um, we were attempting to take indigenous peoples and make them like us. And, and in retrospect, that was wrong. Uh, in retrospect, that was wrong at the time. But, and, and that's still happening in other societies today. And, uh, you know, there, there are societies where people say, you know, there can be only one language. Uh, there can be only one religion. Um, we've seen through history various ways of, of approaching how a society, especially one with uh, a dominant majority represented here by the green circles, um, works with or manages the question of people who are in minorities represented here by the red, blue, and yellow circles. One of them is exclusion or, you know, uh, you just don't let them into the society at all. I call that our immigration policy. No, that's not true. But, but you know, I mean, uh, for a long time it was, right? For a long time, uh, our immigration policy was geared toward accepting only people with certain properties. To a large degree, it still is. To a large degree, our immigration policy is directed toward um, accepting only people with skills, um, with linguistic capacities, with a willingness to adapt, etc. And uh, the exceptions to that, such as family immigration or refugees, are found as particularly problematic to, to various people. I'm not one of those. Um, the other approach is segregation, where, okay, they're in the society, but often their own private places. Uh, in South Africa, that was apartheid, where the green dots were actually the minority. Um, in the U.S., it was, of course, actual segregation. But, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a policy of segregation. You can find this develop on a more um, informal and unplanned basis as well. Um, segregation, if enforced, is a bad thing. Uh, but I think that there should be room for people to be able to form their own communities. Um, so, you know, it's six and one half dozen of the other here, right? Uh, it's, and this is where taking the view or the perspective of, in this case, the minority, is what's really important here. Because we're asking, well, how would you like to live in our society? Um, you know, how would you want to structure this? What works for you? And if they say, you know, I want to live near, say, other Chinese people, or, you know, I want to live, say, in the gay village, that's perfectly acceptable, and that view should be allowed to prevail. Um, integration is kind of like that, where you, you create these special areas within your society to accommodate these particular groups. Uh, so that is a Chinatown. Um, that is a gay village. Uh, but there's still this line of segregation. And actually, I don't really see a huge difference between segregation and integration as they're described in this diagram, except segregation is actually keeping them apart from uh, the rest of society. And so is much more like apartheid um, in a literal sense, uh, whereas integration allows them to be within the society, but there's still walls. Finally, we have inclusion, which is um, policy in Canada, um, and, and I think for the better, in which we have a society in which each individual 
can maintain their own culture and their own social identity. They can keep their distinctiveness as being green or red or blue or yellow. Um, but we all share the same society. And if you go to Mississauga, you see that. Uh, if you watch breakfast television, you see that uh, from City TV, uh, you see that. Um, and that is indeed a model, I think, that Canada is trying to present. Um, I think it's a good model, but it does involve an ethics and a social policy of care. You actually have to think of the other person as human. You actually have to take into account that they are in a minority and therefore um, may be experiencing oppression and are certainly in a more vulnerable position and therefore you have to take special care. The same applies with things like language rights, right? Um, in Canada, we have a linguistic majority and a linguistic minority. And people say, well, why should you give Quebec special privileges for French? But you have to take the perspective of the people who are in the minority who might fear, for example, that their language would be wiped out. And therefore, they have a special interest in preserving and protecting that language. That doesn't mean you agree with everything they say, but that's where you begin your discussion, and that's the dialogue of inclusion. By contrast, we have exclusion, and this is the opposite of care, arguably. Um, and I just want to point out the many ways here in which societies exclude uh, people who most properly we should be including. Uh, historically, we've seen groups excluded because of their socioeconomic status, their culture, including indigenous cultures, linguistic group or language, religion, geography, uh, gender, sexual orientation, age, physical and mental health or ability, status with regard to unemployment, homelessness and incarceration and there are probably more things left out of this list. My own history suggests that having a long hair and beard is a reason for being excluded. Um, I don't know if that really counts as a disadvantaged group but uh, you know it, it does illustrate that this list could be extended probably indefinitely. And that's why, again, you know, you, we can't just have sweeping generalizations, right? We, we can't have a list of the kinds of injustice or vulnerability that will be considered to the exclusion of the rest. I don't think anybody who lists these uh, bases for inclusion are intending to not include others who may be disadvantaged or vulnerable in different ways. In fact, I'm pretty sure they're not. But there needs to be, in my mind, an explicit uh, affirmation that it doesn't matter what the basis for exclusion uh, is. Uh, if the group is excluded or at risk of being excluded, then they're vulnerable, then our discussions with them need to begin with a recognition of that vulnerability and therefore uh, you know a, an attempt to redress that at least from the perspective and for the purposes of engaging in an actual dialogue and reflection. I find this interesting it's in Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks writes a lot about love. One of the most important things that I ever read on giving presentations, it's not the most important thing, um, a book by Keith Spicer called Winging It was probably the most important thing, but what I read was advice to, and I quote, love your audience. Now, there are ways in which that would be very inappropriate. Those aren't the ways that I mean. Um, what the sense of love your audience is, is if you're up there giving a talk, 
uh, it's very tempting to be, you know, um, self-critical, self-reflective, concerned that uh, they might be unhappy with the way you're presenting yourself, um, concerned with how you're being perceived, concern that you might not really be as knowledgeable as you need to be in order to be presenting on this subject uh you know self-doubting self-doubting self-effacing sometimes even self-sabotaging um what's that expression um the uh the imposter syndrome right you might be vulnerable to the imposter syndrome uh feeling like you're faking it and the concept of love your audience is this, that at least at the start of the talk, everybody is in that room because they want to see you. And that's pretty remarkable. Uh, I'm always, when I give a talk, astounded by that. There I am, I'm the guy up on the podium, and there's a whole bunch of people who are there to see me, to listen to me, to watch my bad slides. And how can you not love them for that? You know, and when, when you see it that way, all of a sudden, all you want to do up on that stage is to give as much of yourself to that audience as possible. Um, not to justify or, or anything like that, but more even out of a out of a consciousness of you know this is great. These people really want what I have to share. Let me share it with them as fully as possible. Um, and so you know, I mean, I say things at the beginning of my talks like you know, um, this talk isn't for me; it's for you. Um, if you need to me to do something different from what I'm doing do that and that applies generally if you are actually listening to this video right now and we're well into the video i don't know how far we're in because youtube isn't recording it anymore um so i don't have a counter but man i love you <laughs> i can't believe that you're listening to this or if you're reading this text it's amazing that you're reading this text now, we're not in, in an interactive relationship right now, so I can't change what I'm doing in order to accommodate your specific need. But know this, if I could, I would. Um, in the meantime, um, instead of worrying about maybe I'm not good enough, maybe my words aren't perfect enough, etc., I'm just going to give as fully as possible. You see that a lot in the arts, um, you, you, you know, especially in music, but in acting and, and other things as well, where, uh, you know, the, the, the conversion from somebody who's trying to be a performer to somebody who is a performer is the fullness of their participation in the performance. And you can actually see, especially in young performers, that point in time where they just let go of all of those concerns about themselves and just give themselves over to the performer. And that's when it becomes brilliant, right? Um, and it's not that the self-doubt and all of that doesn't exist. It's just for this moment, we'll just do away with that. I can worry about that later, but for now, I'll just pour myself into this. I think that's kind of what Bell Hooks is after here. Now, there are all kinds of aspects to her theory of love. I mean, she's written an entire book on it, so um, I'm not going to capture all of the nuance here. But that's what I get out of it. She writes, Without an ethic of love, shaping the direction of our political vision and our radical aspirations, we are often seduced in one way or the other into continued allegiance to systems of domination, imperialism, sexism, racism, classism. 
all of these, this is my interpretation now, all of these have their origin in some way in fear or self-doubt. Um, Michael Moore, the filmmaker, um, in his uh, film about guns, says that you know the 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 uh, desire to have guns in American society is based on fear and racism. Is based on fear of black people uh, rising up and, and you know get, getting them back uh, for their years of oppression. And he may have a, a point to that. The main thing here is that it's a fear. It's a self-doubt. Um, you know, there's lots of discussion about how, uh, say, sexism is a way to make up for your own perceived deficiencies by oppressing people of the other gender. Um, there's something to that, but I'm not, again, not going to draw a sweeping theory here because that would be absurd. All of these show up in their different ways. Um, in their very different ways in every individual person. There's no one logic that shapes all of that. But the point here is, if you can set that part of yourself aside, and then when you're in a relation, a teaching relation, a caring relation, a speaking on a podium relation, whatever, um, actually fully give yourself give of yourself to the other um which i've characterized as love your audience then that's when you see the fullest uh, instance instantiation of an ethics of care and i think there's something to that i certainly think you can't be good at whatever it is that you're doing without leaving the self out of it uh, you know, and that goes back to you know to ancient tenets of buddhism and and other philosophies that preach a sort of selflessness and it's not selflessness in the sense of you know my you know, i have no value my thoughts have no meaning etc it's it's the opposite of that it's that i have so much to give to the world that it doesn't make sense for me to withhold any of that because I'm afraid of how the world might perceive me. And that's the problem with oppression and repression and injustice is that we create these conditions where people are genuinely afraid of how the rest of the world will see them. Um, you know, uh, imagine that, a black person singing, uh, you know, Okay, bad example, but you know what I mean, right? Uh, if you have that kind of ethos, then that person is going to be afraid to fully give themselves over to think to singing because they're afraid that there might be some repri reprisal for that. Um, so you need to take that into account, um, and in your relation with that person, allow them or enable them to participate as fully and completely as possible um, without these fears. A lot of the time this comes up in a discussion of the safety of the environment. And of course, people take safety uh, and, and think about it as you know, you know, being free from any sort of possible harm. And I don't really take safety as meaning that. I take safety as meaning um, an environment where the other person can express themselves and give themselves as fully as possible without being constrained by their feelings or apprehensions of harm or reprisal or injustice or any of that. And I think that's why a philosophy of free speech works. It's not because of the inherent right of the person to speak. It's because it's just a better way to address inequalities and oppression and to help every member of society contribute to the fullest extent possible. Um, and if you understand it that way, then when we get into negotiations about what free speech actually is, 
we're working from a completely different basis. Um, one not so much based on some undefined concept of individual freedom that is some sort of ethical universal that we all must subscribe to, but very practical, concrete discussions of why is this person afraid? What is preventing this person from speaking? How do we enable them to most fully express themselves in a way that is comfortable for them and for the rest of society? Totally different thing. And there's danger. This is the danger of the person experienced by the person who's oppressed, right? And that's what we want to focus on when we're in a relationship of care, and especially in a pedagogy of care. Again, love your students, right? When we talk about loving our students, these same voices usually talk about exercising caution. They warn us about the dangers of getting too close, right? But that's to misinterpret it. It goes back to that original discussion way back at the beginning of this presentation on care about the need for doctors to be objective and not emotionally involved with their patients because you know you get too close but you want to get close because you want to be able to get to the point where you're able to understand and indeed even feel the sense of apprehension that they might have. And this is especially the case for vulnerable people, and certainly in hospitals, um, but also in schools and in social situations generally. Which is why we read, when we teach with love, we are better able to respond to the unique concerns of individual students while simultaneously integrating those of the classroom community. It's not about love as, um, you know, romantic love. Um, it's love as this desire and capacity to give of ourself as fully of, as possible to whatever it is that we're doing in order to provide not just care, but care or entertainment or knowledge and, and, you know, getting past that element of fear and having somebody help me get past that element of fear is probably one of the most valuable things in the world. Certainly one of the most valuable things you can do for someone. And that's why it's so essential in a healthcare scenario where the apprehensions aren't just apprehensions. There are real physical dangers that people are facing. They're in a very vulnerable spot because they're injured, they're sick, uh, you know, the, uh, all kinds of things are actually going wrong. And they need to be, you know, not just treated medically, but treated from the perspective that you know, they can express for themselves what would count as being healed or cured or cared for or whatever. You know, this is kind of reflected in a pedagogy of care. And, and, and we, we see it in Mahabali here. Uh, sometimes she begins, begins her paper. The most valuable thing we can offer our students is genuine care for them their well-being, their happiness, not just their grades, not just their learning, but their whole selves. And I think that's true. Um, we're not involved in the process of teaching in order to produce some kind of standardized output, like a grade or even an employment opportunity or even a competency. Um, the educational relation, even a many-to-one education relation, which, which she's talking about here in the context of MOOCs, still involves that. Now, my capacity to interact with every individual in a course of a thousand students is limited. Nonetheless, you know, from the perspective of love your students, 
I can still participate in that course by giving as fully and completely as possible without holding back. And more importantly, I can create the environment in which they can do the same. And if they can do the same, then a lot of the questions about masks go away. And they go away because now they don't need me in particular to interact with. They can interact with each other. They can, you know, they indeed take the same role that I do in a course where they're projecting and giving of themselves as fully as possible. And then that lands where it may. And those interactions with other individuals happen where they may. And there isn't this position of privilege between one person, the instructor, who must interact individually with every other person. Rather, you have this environment where everybody interacts with everybody. And so we can all participate in this dialogue and discussion and learning experience. Um, but this doesn't happen automatically. Um, Bali writes, if you want students to share of themselves, to make themselves vulnerable, you need to start with yourself, as Bell Hooks suggests. And I would read that basically as you model this behavior. You model this attitude that you have where you are responding with love, right? And, you know, consider myself now in this situation. There are all kinds of reasons why I could doubt myself and, and not actually present this video. But giving in to them would be a mistake because then I'm not modeling the sort of participation and engagement and learning and interaction and experience I would like to see on the part of the people taking the course. No matter whether there's one person or a thousand people. Right, so it's on me to share with love and then hope that that spreads uh, and that becomes the learning experience for everyone in the course. And perhaps that's a good place to begin to finish on is to go back to Paolo Freire and others who talked about pedagogy not just as passing on knowledge, not just as um, building skills, but actually helping people build for themselves a better place for themselves in their community. Recognizing the places where injustice and oppression and disadvantage and vulnerability may occur and creating mechanisms and solutions to respond to them. Bell Hooks again. In the last 20 years, uh, and now this is, you know, 30 years ago she's writing. In the last 20 years, educators who have dared to study and learn new ways of thinking and learning so that the work we do does not reinforce systems of domination, of imperialism, racism, sexism, or class elitism have created a pedagogy of hope. Addressing these injustices and vulnerabilities and making them the starting point in the dialogue so that you can as quickly as possible begin to exchange uh, your thoughts, your ideas, your values freely and openly without fear, without reservation. That's where learning begins. That's where an ethics of care begins. So we come back after a long discussion, very long discussion, with the questions that we asked at the beginning. Um, how can neurons care? Is caring driven by evolution? Is this cultural evolution or biological evolution? Does it depend on rules and rationalities? Does it require attachment? And we can see that there aren't any particular answers to these questions because maybe these are not necessarily the right questions. Um, because they're, they're asking for something like a scientific theory in response. And that's not really how it happens. 
Um, you know, there is evolution, maybe. Uh, certainly there's trial and error and adaption, adaptation and change and all the hallmarks of evolution. Some of it is cultural, some of it is biological. Um, perhaps caring is innate, but for our purposes, what matters most is that part of it which is not innate um, and which requires valuing, development, bringing forth, etc. Certainly from the perspective of analytics and artificial intelligence, I can tell you right off the bat that Caring in a physical device, not innate. Uh, and if we want machines that care, um, we would have to design it into them. And I think we want to design it into them. But when we ask what that means, we don't want to give quite the same answer because we don't want machines to operate without fear. Um, although, in a real sense, machines do operate without fear. So... Maybe that's the problem. Um, but we want them to operate in a way that respects uh, our position, um, that respects the particularity of our position, and especially conditions where we may be vulnerable, um, and responds according to our expressed needs and not by some predefined, algorithmically defined. Uh, interpretation of what I and everybody else must actually need. We don't want our machines to be colonial. Uh, we, we don't want our machines to adopt this position that we know better. Um, can we instantiate that in a machine? Well, how do we instantiate that in people? That's what this talk this particular video was about, right? How can we get a person who's made up of neurons to care? Well, we, we went through the semantic condition, autonomy, openness, interactivity, and diversity, and we looked at you know ways in which the philosophy of care addresses those. We looked at the mechanisms, um, model and demonstrate, practice and reflect, and looked at how the ethics of care discusses those and something like that um, is going to be an approach that can describe how we can in individual circumstances uh, lead them to be in a position where they can care but what does it mean to care well let's go back to bell hooks it means to love but what does it mean to love to be able to give yourself as fully and as completely as possible to the task at hand um, for the benefit of whoever it is that you're working with. Um, that doesn't mean becoming their servant or slave. It just means completely and totally offering your capacities in that particular situation, that particular environment. Now, that sounds like a sweeping theory, but in those broad generalizations are the exceptions that make this the rule, right? We know that this looks different every time and in every place that we practice it. The needs of the individuals are different and specific and context dependent. The needs of the, or the capacities and the abilities and the needs of the person providing the care are similarly individual and specific and context dependent, especially from the perspective of how the rest of the community regards them, enables them, treats them, or oppresses them. I mean, all of these factors matter. So if we look at that from that perspective, we begin to see how we can generate in our society an ethics of care. And part of my contention in this course is that if we want an ethics of analytics and AI, we're going to need to do something similar. We can't come up with general rules or principles that just simply ignore the position of 
any individual is in or any AI is in and, and treat them as though they're all the same. Not going to work. Um, and we want to encourage the best in both ourselves and in our machines. The most complete expression of what their capabilities are in the service of helping the other. Um, that's a hard, that's a, I was going to say that's a hard sell, but I don't think it's a hard sell, but it's a hard proposition. It's a hard task. Um, it's hard to comprehend how we could do that. But again, the purpose of this course is only partially say, okay, here's how we do that. And really, we're not going to solve that problem here. But it's to address the presumption that we could have some kind of overarching plan or pedagogy, whether it be a critical pedagogy or whether it be something else that basically imposes a structure or framework over us and says, this is how we should view the world. Doesn't work that way. Um, and, you know, even the practice of picking one of these and using it as a lens and interpreting the world in that way, it doesn't work that way. Anytime you use a lens, you're distorting whatever the actual situation is in reality. And what you want to do is get as close as you can without distorting it. Um, I could go on, but I won't go on. That's this video. I want to talk a little bit before we wrap up the ethics of care on how we can pull back a bit and, and think about um, a broader way of understanding it and comprehending it so that we can talk not just about caring professions but about the broader range of, of, of how we learn and how we promote these kinds of relationships in general. Um, so that'll be a discussion of sentiments. That's the next video, and that's the one that will wrap up this module on the ethics of care. So thank you. I'm Stephen Downs. I hope you enjoyed this, um, and I'll see you again.